of course. Uh, well, it is my pleasure to introduce Chi Xu Shang. Uh, he is right now a senior astrophysicist at Harvard Uni uh, Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics oh, <laughs> um, at Harvard University. And Chi Xu and I have known each other for a long time. And uh, he has a deep interest in the formation of massive star forming regions, massive clusters, and, um, and fragmentation in, in these regions. So uh, this is what he is an expert in observing, and this is what he's been uh, talking, he's going to talk to us about today. He, he got uh, his bachelor degree in China, in Nanjing University, and then got his both his master's and PhD uh, at Harvard um, itself. Uh, so apparently they liked him very much uh, there because he's been there almost all his life. So it's great uh, to have you here, Chiju, and to talk to us about fragmentation and massive star formation. Chiju, please. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation and for the, uh, Enrique, for the introduction. And, and really, um, I would say that, uh, you know, outside of uh, my CFA route, I have a lot of actually collaboration uh, with uh, you folks in there. And so it's good to see you, uh, even though, you know, online, uh, I hope that, uh, you know, we have opportunity to connect in person as well. Um, so what I want to uh, share with you uh, today of some of the work we've been doing uh, literally over a decade, uh, it was tried to uh, understand the sort of fragmentation and protostellar cluster formation. Um, so I want to acknowledge some of the collaborators uh, that uh, mainly that uh, I uh, contribute to the work that I showed today, uh, Yu Chao uh, and Junhao Lu, who are uh, graduate students. And uh, Junhao has just graduated last year um, and also uh, work with uh, Aina quite a bit uh, on some of the frag uh, fragmentation involving magnetic fields. Uh, also, uh, uh, Ping Chu, who is a faculty at Nanjing in China, um, and Ke Wan. Um, uh, both of them are uh, my uh, former students, actually, at the CFA. Um, I just mentioned that, uh, you know, I also have been working with Roberto uh, on uh, a very interesting uh, uh, topic on the uh, sort of ionization uh, in massive star forming regions and accretion flows in ionized gas. Uh, I won't be able to show uh, any of that today, uh, but hopefully we'll have an opportunity uh, to uh, discuss that at some point in the future. So um, the, all right, um, so uh, the, why do we worry, why do we uh, care about the uh, formation of uh, massive stars and clusters? Um, and most of the stars in our galaxy uh, and, and also external galaxies uh, form uh, not in isolation, they form in uh, dense clusters. Um, and they come in different sort of shape and forms uh, going from, um, NGC 1333 on the left. Uh, this is a sort of a small cluster of about 100 stars uh, in Perseus molecular cloud uh, to like thousands of stars you're seeing in Orion Nebula cluster uh, to those more massive young clusters um, that contain uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of stars and in very uh, densely packed. Uh, they are relatively rare in our own galaxy, but if they are really prevalent, uh, in, especially in starburst galaxies. So the, we know that the star formation begins in molecular clouds. Uh, so those clusters, we find them in uh, GMCs that uh, quite often uh, are filamentary. Uh, they have typically mass of you know, tens or hundreds of solar masses with average density is about 100 particles per cubic centimeter. So they are best traced by say carbon monoxide um, uh, for that density. Um, so in those regions you see uh, in, in those filamentary uh, molecular clouds, you often find those, um, so that we call the protocluster forming clumps. So those are sort of a roughly a parsec scale in size with density of um, tens, um, of thousands of particles per cubic centimeter. Uh, so that's where you actually know that with that density, the gravity actually start to be uh, quite important. Uh, so the massive ones uh, have tens or um, uh, a, a thousand or tens of thousands solar masses. So those are the places we find forming dense clusters. Um, so the question is how do you take this sort of a, a diffuse uh, gaseous cloud 
uh, that uh, the collapse and fragment to give rise to a young cluster that's such as you know the one that's shown on the screen, the young stellar cluster in Orion, that have ten, uh, you know, a hundred or thousands of stars with range of stellar masses. Of course, uh, the physical parameters or physical environment matters in this case, uh, both um, you know, temperature, density, of course, you need gravity, turbulence, magnet fields, feedback, and time evolution as well. So it's, it's a rather evol you know, uh, evolving complex uh, process to form this. Um, so the questions that we, uh, we want to ask uh, to get answered to is the, how those massive clumps fragment into dense cores and what sort of uh, physical parameters that influence this fragmentation, including magnetic fields. In particular, how do we form massive cores? Um, because we know that uh, uh, when we talk about fragmentation, we can think of a sort of genes fragmentation of a uniform density of gas of a cloud. You have this uh, uh, sort of a, a mass above which that the gas become unstable to collapse, right? So for typical clumps, if you look at the physical parameters, they have sort of genes mass about a solar mass or so, you know, give and take a factor of two or so. So how do you form those massive cores to give rise to, you know, massive stars of 10 solar masses or more? So that's one of the cha uh, challenges uh, that we need to understand. And also um, I want to actually look at this process of a cluster formation, whether to proceed in equilibrium. Um, so, um, so when we talk about the fragmentation, of course, this is intimately uh, related to, um, you know, the initial mass function, the origin of initial mass function, right? How that relates to sort of a core mass function. Uh, of the dense molecular gas. Um, so I mentioned that the genes mass actually sort of more or less coincides within 30% or so uh, of the peak of the cellar uh, mass uh, in, the, in the cellar IMF. And, and we want to understand what's the origin of those massive cores that give, rest, give, um, give rise to those massive stars in the cluster. Um, so let's step back a little bit uh, to look at what the theory or numerical simulations giving uh, uh, telling us. Um, so the numerical simulation have shown that uh, actually when you have the clumps with a very centrally peak density uh, structures, they tend to fragment to fewer um, uh, dense cores as shown uh, in those three panels. This is the increase of density profiles uh, index P uh, here. So for shallow structures, they tend to fragment more. Um, that's to be understandable qualitatively because you, um, when you have the deep gravitational potential, the gas is going to collapse and, and form fewer fragments. Um, so the um, In terms of turbulence, uh, it's a mixed bag. Uh, it, it could be both promoting or, um, or suppressing uh, fragmentation uh, depend on the nature of turbulence. If it's coral free, so-called compressive or divergent free or solenoidal. Uh, so the compressed uh, uh, turbulence you can think of like a shock process that, that actually uh, um, compress the gas to create the high density, uh, density structures. And then when you have solenoidal uh, turbulence and that uh, act like a sort of a, a pressure term that actually hold the gravity from collapsing. Um, so this is one of the simulations that uh, um, by uh, um, uh, Federer uh, and collaborators, and I should mention that the others have done on this topic. As you can see that the, when you have two different type of turbulence, uh, they actually uh, produce very different density structures. Uh, this is the density probability function of vertical axis uh, versus the, uh, the S parameter, which um, uh, is uh, the tracer of the uh, density. So when it comes to magnetic fields, I think there's a, a, a sort of a consensus that the strong field tend to uh, suppress fragmentation as shown uh, again, in, the, in this uh, simulation here of a different mass to flux ratio of mu parameter. So for uh, strong magnetic magnetized core, they tend to fragment fewer into a few fragments uh, versus sort of weak magnetic uh, fuel cases that you, you see a lot of fragments. Um, okay, so here's the outline in my talk. Um, 
that uh, we um, will talk about the origin of the massive cause and then uh, I'll address this question whether we can actually have a one uh, direct CMF core mass function going to stellar initial mass function. Uh, I'll talk about the effect of physical environments on fragmentation, including magnet, row magnet fields. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on the equilibrium star formation. I'll give you uh, a few, a few uh, conclusions and outlook. Um, so um, when we talk about the fragmentation, I think that the, um, there's uh, the best place to, to look and uh, is that initially how they fragment uh, that, you know, um, that is a place that is uh, useful because you have a little feedback that impact in the environment. Um, and, and also a little uh, time evolution for you to tra trace back to initial physical conditions that led to the fragmentation you observe. So, so those so-called infrared dark clouds um, are, are prime candidate for this kind of study. Um, this is the one of the infrared dark clouds that we've studied uh, over a decade and now uh, this uh, infrared dark cloud G28.34. Uh, on the left is the A micron Spitzer image. As you can see that, that you see this uh, dark lane is the, uh, due to the uh, uh, absorption of coal dust against uh, a galactic background. And you see that um, the ammonia gas shown in contour that follow this uh, dark lane pretty well. It's also uh, in this cold dust thing in uh, uh, the Mumbo map, which is RM 30 meter telescope. You, you see that the, um, you know, this, uh, the, the emission in 1.2 millimeter continuum also trace this dark lane in the, uh, in the infrared as well. Um, so we focus on uh, two regions, um, but before we go that, just uh, sort of orient it. Uh, this, uh, this cloud is quite massive and this uh, Orion uh, molecular clouds here that, uh, you know, six parsecs or so, it's part of the integral uh, filament structure that's seen in Orion. Uh, it's sort of comparable to the size of, uh, of uh, infrared dark cloud G28. Uh, so we focus on those two regions. One is in the north, about 1,000 solar mass. It has already uh, significant luminosity of um, 1,000 or more uh, solar luminosity. So this is sort of a typical region that you, already, you know that already forming high mass protostellar object. What's interesting is this southern region that have comparable uh, amount of mass in the clump scale, uh, but it's very under luminous. There's only a luminosity about 10 to the two um, or so. And it's also have a relatively low temperature. Uh, so this is um, uh, the region that we think that will at very uh, early evolution stage uh, will eventually become uh, this P2 region, uh, but um, so when we look at this region image in continuum uh, with the sublimit array at 1.3 millimeter wavelengths, um, you can see that the, this, uh, this elongated structure actually get resolved into um, a string of uh, uh, five uh, dense molecular cores with mass is about 22 here, uh, 38. The most massive one is the 64 solar masses. And, and when you look at uh, the genes mass uh, of, of that clump using the average density in the clump, uh, you can see that the actually is you get the, uh, the, the thermal genes mass is about two solar masses. Immediately you see the core mass that we detected it's about a factor of 10 or more larger uh, than the thermal genes mass. Um, so what we propose is that when you look at the, the velocity dispersion in spectral lines, uh, and you get sort of turbulent genes mass uh, that uh, about 30 solar mass. So that's compatible uh, sort of an order of magnitude uh, uh, with, the, uh, with what we observe in, in those dense cores. So the turbulence certainly you need it. Uh, it's probably more kind of solenoidal type of turbulence. It's needed to actually form those uh, massive cores. Um, and, and the magnetic fields uh, probably also play a role uh, that, that will come to uh, that point um, uh, in, in later part of my talk. Um, so when we look at this uh, at the high angle resolution with slightly better sensitivity with the SMA, uh, those regions actually further fragment, okay? Okay, so just show here that some of them are actually break into three dense um, condensations. Now, 
Uh, so the masses become smaller because they break up. Um, so there are a few solar masses also. But if you look at the local genes mass, because the density in the core has been uh, is higher as well. Uh, so the the local gene thermal genes mass is about um, half so 0.4 solar mass. So again, what you see in those condensations actually is about a factor of 10 uh, more massive than the local genes mass. So, so this is what we call sort of hierarchical uh, fragmentation uh, in those molecular clouds when lead to a cluster formation. But you also highlight the sort of uh, difficulty uh, as observer when you analyze fragmentation, because if, you, if I give you this map, uh, you look at those uh, mass of the core, if you compare with the global genes mass, you would come to a very different conclusion saying, oh, they coming from thermal genes mass or it's thermal genes fragmentation. Um, uh, so that's also emphasized the need for looking at the clouds at the very early stage so that you don't have to actually back track to what the initial conditions that led to those uh, uh, fragmentation you see. All right, so uh, one of the ideas that was proposed uh, more than a decade ago that you can actually uh, increase the genes mass by sort of stellar radiation. Uh, this is the, one of uh, ideas that uh, uh, Mark Kromholtz and the company uh, has proposed. So we look at the temperature map uh, in, in, in G2834. This is a, a map uh, based on ammonia observations from VOA. As you can see that actually those condensations actually sitting in the lo really low temperature regions. Of course, even the high temperature in here is only less than 20 Kelvin. Um, that it happens in the outskirt of this cloud. Uh, so the, the suddenly the, in, the idea of increasing temperature is, is not enough to increase the, uh, the, the thermal genes mass. Uh, so you really need a turbulence and, and perhaps magnet fields to uh, increase those um, uh, mass of the fragment. So we have looked at those uh, a several quite a, a sample infrared dark clouds I shown here uh, with uh, some of my, uh, my uh, uh, former students here at the CFA. Look at this fragmentation. So this is a plot that summarizes the um, uh, those results. So this, what's it showing a vertical axis is, is the mass of the fragment of the different structures we identify at that different angle resolution. Um, so this is the separation of nearest neighbor. Uh, as you can see that actually um, there are objects that consistent with the thermal genes mass uh, here, but majority of them actually need a turbulence support in those, we should also mention that, uh, you know, um, the, uh, the limit of the observations uh, of the sensitivity limit of the SMA observation or miss most of the low mass cores in the data I show uh, that um, sort of when the armor comes on online that uh, that actually really helped to push the, uh, the sensitivity uh, to much deeper level. Um, <clears throat> I just want to quickly um, uh, show uh, this study that when you look at infrared dark clouds, you know, they're often look at, uh, shown very filamentary structures. Uh, this is the study that uh, we completed recently with my graduate student in Utah, uh, looking at the uh, DR21 filament uh, here. And this is the, uh, the molecular line observation with a single dish telescope, iron uh, 30 meter telescope. As you can see that you have a lot of large scale filamentary structures. The scale bar here is the three parsecs. So we're talking about 10 parsec uh, sort of um, uh, in a linear size uh, of this map. Uh, what we uh, focus on this, the, DR, the, the densest part of the DR21 OH filament. And, and when we observe uh, with comma, in set of molecular lines, uh, you can actually see that there are three distinctive uh, velocity uh, components that's shown in here. Uh, it's also shown a map on the top right, um, uh, both in uh, H13CO plus, N2H plus, and now deuterate ammonia. Uh, now, the deuterate species actually tracing somewhat uh, uh, sort of early stage of gas. But what's interesting is that when you look at the velocity structure, there are three filaments uh, here that they actually converge into DR21OH. So what we think 
you know, those filament structure is, is really uh, funneling uh, the gas towards the, um, this uh, dense cluster region, DR21OH, here uh, as, as shown in this velocity structure of one of the filaments. All right, so, um, so just to uh, uh, summarize what we're seeing about formation massive cores, I hope that I convince you that those massive cores that give rise to massive stars, um, I really need a turbulent support to form those. Um, um, and, and as you can see, the sum of the fragments does not have enough mass to form massive stars. That also shows that the fragments must continue to gain mass from the environment. Um, so what about low mass stars that uh, in those clusters? So we, uh, I show you this region that initially done with the sun millimeter ray at the uh, 1.3 millimeter band. So this is also ALMA band six. When we look at the, with ALMA, uh, as you can see that you see a lot more structure and a lot deeper. And in particular, uh, you know, this core that initially it was a single one, 38 solar masses, actually they break into four. You know, the other three actually are a lot fainter uh, that the uh, SMA initially did not detect. Uh, by the way, this is a logarithmic scale. So those color scales that, uh, you know, even though it's a small difference, the, the difference in, uh, in linear scale and mass is quite different. Okay, so, so with this ARMA image uh, that go about 30 times uh, deeper than our SMA observations, we're able to actually detect with a sensitivity of 0.2 solar masses at the three sigma mass sensitivity. Um, so one of the interesting thing that we, we found is that actually, if you look at the core mass function in this small cluster, you have more massive cores uh, if you assume this is need to be a uh, saltpeter uh, sort of initial mass function uh, type of slope. Um, Actually, there's a, a factor of five uh, deficit in low mass cores. Um, so one of the ideas that we floated is that the perhaps in this kind of region that a distributed low mass uh, uh, protostars will form at the later stage uh, that after you forming, you know, of those dense structures that give rise to massive stars. Um, all right, so um, let's move on to the next topic that, that whether the initial, uh, the core mass function that sets up the initial mass function. There were a uh, lot of discussions in the literature that I will not have time to review it. I just want to show uh, the work that we've done also uh, recently um, uh, looking at the Cygnus X uh, giant molecular clouds that's shown in here. Uh, this is roughly about a, a hundred parsec or so. Uh, this is four color image that was done uh, collected from Spitzer. Um, and, and the red color corresponds to 24 micron emissions. So those are uh, tracing somewhat colder uh, uh, dust and gas. And to orient you, uh, the uh, DR21 filament I was show earlier is around here. If you can see my, uh, follow my cursor here. So what we've done uh, with this region is to use the Herschel observation to create a column density map. And then uh, I, I run the, uh, the structure identification uh, in, in this region. And, and what this is, uh, uh, so uh, Yue Chao has uh, found uh, over 8,000 dense cores in, in this region. Um, and so when you look at uh, the, uh, the probability distribution of those dense cores uh, here, that's what's shown in the left. As you can see, actually, uh, for the high mass regime, um, you have a saltpeter type of uh, a slope for the core mass function. And, you know, it's very tempting to, to suggest, hey, you know, maybe you just have some kind of star formation efficiency to shift this into the stellar IMF. Uh, however, we, we follow those cores up with a summoning array, and we, saw, we found almost in all the cases, those cores actually further fragment. Uh, so this is a shown in the top right uh, panel, uh, four panels here that cross, uh, those crosses are uh, identified 
uh, condensations uh, with the SMA observation. So there isn't a one-to-one -one translation between a core and protostar. They, the gas is going to continue to fragment in this process. Um, all right, so uh, now I want to move on to my next topic, which is the effect of physical environment, uh, including uh, in particular magnetic fields. So um, uh, more, literally about, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, we actually uh, started this SMA legacy survey uh, looking at uh, over 20 mass molecular clumps to map them in dust polarization and, and with the idea that uh, you hopefully have a large enough sample we can actually find a statistical trend that how magnet field affect the fragmentation. So there were a lot of people involved in this project initially. Uh, what I want to discuss today are, are the two papers that's looking at overall uh, properties uh, of, um, uh, of this survey. Um, so just want to show you some of the maps. This is one of the uh, regions mapped uh, in, uh, in our sample of G. 240 that drives a, a, a bipolar, well-behaved bipolar um, molecular outflow. Um, in the central part, you see this magnet fields that's shown in the uh, yellow line segments um, and has sort of a more or less hourglass morphology that uh, related to this. And, and you can actually derive magnet fields um, just using force balance or some of the statistical method. And what we find is about uh, a one milli gauss in here with a mass flux ratio of 1.1. Um, here's an entire sample of uh, that we mapped. Um, and there's a variety of uh, behavior actually in terms of magnetic fields uh, configuration or topologies. Um, so what we've done in this is that to look at the multi-scale analysis comparison of magnetic fields, that is that compare the high resolution uh, magnet field maps that obtained with the sublimit array with the single dish um, uh, maps. So uh, I'll de demonstrate the example here in DR21 filament. So this is the filament here that uh, has been mapped with JSMT in polarization shown in the left panel. Uh, so you have the, uh, the red line segments uh, denotes the orientation magnet fields. So we mapped uh, the DR21 H in the center, and that's a map in the right-hand side. As you can see that actually, when you look at the high angle resolution with the SMA, you actually see a lot of detail structures in magnetic fields that, uh, you know, at low resolution look at, uh, they are just look at more or less uniform in the east-west direction. So what we've done is to compare the difference in orientation of magnetic fields, and you calculate for every independent pixels done with the SMA, and then you do this for the entire sample, but normalize for the same this linear resolution because to account for the difference in distance uh, in, in, in our sample. So this is what we see uh, here. This is just the number of vertical axis, just a simple count of number of segments that independent segments in the SMA observations. The uh, X axis is the difference of angle between the SMA data and the clump scale, the single dish data. So you have on the left will be the parallel of magnetic fields uh, between the two different spatial scales. And then on the right is the, that the two are perpendicular, so 90 degrees. Now, uh, for randomly disputed, if the two quantity is not related, you should see the flat line. The fact that you see this kind of a, a, a bimodal distribution it really suggests that magnetic fields is dynamically important in channeling the gas from the clump scale, parsec clump scale to 0.1, uh, sort of parsec dense core. Um, now, to get the quantitative um, uh, result from the polarization maps, you have to make a lot of assumptions. One of the um, one of the ways to do this is the event by Davis, Chan, Sega, and Fermi. So it's the DCF method uh, that, that, um, that's that been uh, actually uh, proposed more than seven, about 70 years ago. Uh, the idea is that when, when you have a cloud that's threaded by uniform magnet fields and you have this uh, 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 MHC waves that perturb the magnet fields, so create this kind of turbulent component of magnet fields. 
Okay, so so if you have the turbulent component that much smaller than the uh, the uniform component, and assuming that uh, the iphonic uh, perturbation in this case caused the um, the perturbation you see in the magnetic fields. So you have this energy balance between the kinetic energy of turbulent kinetic energy and turbulent magnetic energy, okay? So if you write this out uh, of the uh, equality and then um, recognizing that your uh, perturbed component is the uniform component times a small angle of, uh, of, of that perturbation, okay? Um, and that actually uh, happens to equals, if you just apply this formula, uh, you get, that's what you get is um, uh, times the uh, scale of the density and, and also the line width um, of the turbulence that you're seeing here. So if you reorder uh, this equation, you actually can, can infer the strengths of magnetic fields and that's related to the line width and also the dispersion. Uh, of the uh, of the orientation magnetic fields. Um, I should mention that um, uh, we recently uh, uh, used a numerical simulation to calculate, uh, to, to see how accurate uh, this method is uh, for the cluster formation environment. Uh, so this is the work um, uh, done by uh, uh, Jun Hao Liu uh, in uh, about two years ago. Um, and to actually come up with this uh, calibration parameter Q. And, and, and we, what we found is that for a strong magnetic field case, uh, this, um, you actually, uh, this factor is, is between you know, 0.2 to 0.5. Um, that's similar to some of the other, uh, the previous work that uh, I mentioned, uh, the reference that's shown here in slightly different uh, physical uh, conditions uh, than what, we, uh, what we've done here. All right, so let's look at the fragmentation and how that relates to the um, um, the uh, magnetic fields or magnetic field relates to the fragmentation. So this is a work done uh, several years ago uh, for another infrared dark clouds T14. Uh, uh, what we focus on, uh, this is the work by uh, uh, Nacho Inez Lopez um, uh, for his uh, PhD thesis. Um, and, and so, when you look at those two regions, with this is the map with the CSO. Uh, as you can see, that in the northern region you have a more or less uniform magnetic fields, whereas in southern region, the magnetic fields is more randomly oriented. So when you look at those two regions, and then uh, at the high angle resolution with the SMA, actually you see that uh, in 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 the region with uniform magnetic fields, um, actually you see a far fewer uh, fragments uh, uh, at the high angle resolution as shown in this continuum emission, uh, versus in the in the southern region, actually you see a lot more fragmentation. So this would be sort of consistent with what I shown you uh, earlier uh, in, in numerical simulations. So, um, so I mentioned that with the SMA, we map a sample of objects in polarization and also has a dust continuing emission. So um, a few years ago, um, uh, Aina actually took on this uh, uh, really uh, uh, you know, important task to look at the fragmentation and how the fra uh, number of fragments relate to magnetic field properties. Um, so what we've done in this work is look at objects less than three kiloparsecs so that we can attain uh, you know, better linear resolution. So there are a total of 18 objects in our sample study that has the magnetic field uh, or dust polarization measurement. So this sort of a, a, a uh, just summarize some of the key findings uh, in, in this paper. Um, so what's plotted on the left panel is a number of uh, fragments versus sort of average density uh, in, in the clump or in the core. Uh, as you can see that the, this is what's expected that the, you at the high density, the gas going to uh, frag, uh, you know, the, the medium going to fragment uh, into a few uh, more fragments. Uh, what's interesting uh, is that on this right-hand side is that number of fragment, uh, fragments also is, uh, looks like a weekly uh, related to mass flux ratio, which is shown here. Um, the sample is, um, you know, is not uniform because they come from different physical environment. 
so it's it's difficult to tease out this effect, and and we are sort of working to looking at uh, more uh, samples with sort of more uniform uh, physical environment to uh, looking at this fact uh, effect, especially with a uh, high gel um, uh, with with the um, uh, with the uh, armor gel uh, project. And as you mentioned, the INA also uh, study uh, this effect um, uh, with other physical parameters uh, in uh, both in 2013, 2014, and 2015. Uh, this is uh, the paper that uh, in her uh, 2014 paper that shown that uh, the number of fragments actually also appears to be correlated with the um, with the density profiles uh, in 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 the dense core, as as shown, you know, um, uh, suggested in the numerical simulation that I showed earlier. All right, so um, now I want to uh, move on to the last topic, which is the uh, equilibrium star formation. Uh, I think the um, I think for uh, uh, this is important uh, for the in terms of theory. Um, so it all started um, in nineteen. You know, this is. Uh, uh, about you know 40 years ago uh, when uh, Richard Lawson uh, looking at uh, a sample molecular clouds measure its size uh, more measure its line width um, and and you know this is a sort of well-known Lawson uh, Lawson's law or line width size relation again uh, also uh, there are others uh, so one of the things you notice in in this sample is that actually, you have roughly uh, the clouds in rough equilibrium uh, shown in this bottom panel here in his paper. So what he said is that, uh, you know, those structures are, are gravitational bound in, uh, in approximate zero equilibrium. Now, why is this important? I think this is uh, really a foundation uh, for many of the theoretical work since then. Uh, you know, a dense coal uh, in theory is the entity in hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, um, however, um, this appeared to be uh, more recent observations point out otherwise that, uh, uh, you know, those dense structures we're seeing in the cluster does not seem to be uh, in, in the viral equilibrium. Uh, so this is a compilation of data that you are comparing the viral mass. This is essentially just ignoring all the terms and, and also magnet fields, just using the line width here uh, as a sigma. Uh, versus the gas mass that uh, observed um, for the region. So, so as you can see that, uh, you know, there's a large scatter here, but the, the solid line is that when, when you have alpha equals to one, of course, uh, for, you know, binary inverse sphere, which, um, you have alpha equals two. Um, However, you see a lot of data points with alpha that much less than one here. So that really challenged the idea of, uh, of uh, equilibrium star formation. Uh, however, if you have strong enough magnetic fields, you know, you're gonna move those data points up. Um, so those are the, just the sort of the strengths of the fail you need for different structures to move that up to from half, uh, viral parameter of half to one. Um, so, um, so we start looking at this by, you know, uh, estimating the strengths of magnetic fields and to see how those variable parameters may uh, vary. So this is the study that we've done with ALMA uh, in dust polarization. And this is sort of, uh, you see the maps, uh, the line segments are white, light segments are the magnetic field orientations. Uh, and you see the, this is a detection magnetic fields on those, along those uh, a string of dense cores. And then towards MM9, we sort of have a well, just barely detection towards the brightest uh, point. So we estimate the magnetic fields for MM1, MM4, and this is summarized here. As you can see that, you know, the turbulent, um, the turbulent comp component uh, of those, uh, uh, the um, of viral uh, mass is like 120. Uh, and then if you consider magnetic fields, uh, you get 61. So the two are comparable. So if you add in that, I think you can actually really uh, raise the, uh, the alpha close, much closer to one. So this is a one case study. And since then, uh, we look at the bigger sample uh, to try to see you know, how, how this may be uh, effect of evolution, right? How the magnetic fields may evolve. 
Um, if you you know go back to uh, this uh, the study of a Zeman experiment uh, uh, by uh, Dick Crofter and um, uh, his collaborators, what he looked at is the uh, the line of sight component uh, using a Zeman experiment and what for the entire sample. What he found is that for the for low column densities, you have this uh, the masses that actually uh, mass flux ratio is less than critical value. And, and when go to high densities, you have those clouds appear to be, you know, uh, super critical here. So we look at this problem by taking about 230 regions that have dust polarization observation. We re-estimate the magnetic fields using the calibration that we've done in numerical simulation. Uh, so this is the plot uh, that, uh, of course, this is the, um, the total magnetic fields um, that, um, we estimate here. Again, I think that the trend is not as clear, but it does seem to be that you do have some, you know, low density um, clouds that have the uh, the mass flux ratio actually uh, as subcritical, and then you have the data points on the uh, the clouds that um, at a high densities, average densities, they tend to be uh, super critical. Uh, which is quite interesting, actually, given that this, you know, magnetic fields really estimate using the uh, davis chan sega fermi method, uh, which is subject to um, some uncertainties. Um, we also look at this, how the magnetic viral parameter varies, actually. So this is alpha, which is, um, uh, sorry, this formula should not be here. Actually, it's alpha B is defined by uh, the magnetic viral mass divided by gas mass here. So what you can see that actually, again, uh, you see this uh, decreasing trend that uh, uh, at the high, high densities that, you know, the magnetic viral parameters actually far less than one. Um, uh, this is point to an evolution that actually, even though when you have a gas, as gas collapse, uh, you amplify the magnet fields, but the gravity becomes much stronger actually to, to offset the increase in magnetic viral mass. So, um, so that you actually, that parameter still continue to decrease. Um, okay, I want to I'll leave you with um, uh, some conclusion here. Um, I hope, I hope that I convince you that uh, for those really massive cores in dense cluster, uh, that uh, they, uh, they are not consistent with thermal genes mass, uh, that you really need a turbulence and, and magnetic fields to actually raise those uh, uh, characteristic of mass during the fragmentation. Um, the, the full polarization surveys, uh, it really show that the magnetic fields uh, play a, a dynamically important role uh, uh, in collapse of uh, during the protocluster formation um, and the formation of dense cores. Um, and it looks like protocluster formation does not evolve in, in the viral equilibrium. And this is a sort of a similar conclusion of seeing in low mass uh, star formation as well. Um, and, and observations of somewhat limited sample begin to reveal a trend that how environmental effect uh, impact fragmentation. I think this is suddenly a lot more work uh, to be done. Uh, so I just want to show that, you know, some of the work that we're taking the polarization uh, to ALMA um, uh, because, you know, thanks to take advantage of its sensitivity. Um, so one of the things that I want to uh, show is that uh, we're, we're following up um, a subset of, uh, of those uh, clumps that observed in ALMA gal sample uh, in full polarization. And, um, um, to look at the objects with a lot of fragmentation and a lot of objects with few fragmentation to see whether the magnetic fields uh, topology are different. Uh, and uh, we're hoping to uh, get data uh, from the current uh, ALMA cycle, um, um, but we also resubmit our proposal. And if we don't get data, hopefully, uh, you know, the tech will be uh, fa favorably uh, rank our proposal and and you know I'll get um, I'll get to observe in the future. All right, uh, I'll stop here and thank you and I'll um, be glad to answer any questions you may have.
<laughs> hey, thanks a lot. Uh, any question? Any questions from here, from the auditorium? Roberto? Uh, uh, regarding this excess velocity, can you go to the slide, uh, one of these slides with, where you show the virial parameter at high column densities? Uh, when you show this, ah, uh, because who controls the presentation, Jacopo or? No. Ah, okay. C can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Uh, okay, C can you show again any of these plots of the velocity expression at high column densities or in the range of column densities? Uh, so essentially you are getting that there is excess, excess velocity dispersion at high column densities, correct? Okay, are you referring to this one or no? For the previous one, uh, that you have a, a very high uh, serial parameter at high column density, is, is that correct? No. You mean this one? Yeah, well, we, you, you are always around one, but you show that, that when you go to very high column densities, uh, you depart from the relation, no? Uh, maybe in the following plots. Uh, yeah, like Either that one. No, be this one or this one, right? Yeah, so, so you have, so you have excess velocity dispersion, right? Is, is that, is that the, the, the apparent problem, no? Yeah, so, okay, so yes, um, uh, Roberto, so in this plot, this is only magnetic, Viral parameter, so it is not including the um, the turbulent uh, viral mass in here. Right. Okay. So okay. I, Go ahead. Sorry. So I think the um, we we thought about this uh, suddenly, and because the the data were taken from literature, so we don't have the uh, the spectral line information for entire sample. But suddenly, it'll be interesting to see. If the uh, the the turbulent uh, viral mass actually will be also be increasing to offset this decrease. Oh, okay, so then I got confused. Uh, never mind then. Uh, thanks. More questions? No, if not, uh, uh, we go online with uh, Gilberto. Hi. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um. I, in this same plot, I would like to interpret your results as slightly different. To me, the mass to flux ratio is a nil defined quantity because it's going to, to depend on where do you define your boundary for the cloud or plumb or whatever you, you're using. If you go to a deeper observation or with different tracer, you're going to measure a different amount of mass. And maybe if you use a different technique to measure the magnetic field, you're also going to, to measure something different. So in this particular plot, I interpret it like if you have higher column density, you are actually able to see more of the mass that is involved in the formation and evolution of the clump. Uh, what do you think about that, that point of view? What? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. I think the its point is well taken. So um, let me just explain the approach we did uh, in here. Uh, so, the, so the observation was taken sort of uh, from different telescopes, uh, including Planck, uh, actually, uh, uh, Planck satellite. So there's the, uh, you're right that, that they are dealing with different scale. So this column density, say, if we have a, analyzed a map of a large, much larger region, this column density is the average density of the entire region because the, the, the magnetic field strength that we derived is also using all the data in that region. So you sort of have a one data point, even though you have a lot of individual measurements of in terms of magnetic field orientation or, you know, if you look at the column density in one pixel, there may be one value, it varies, but we take the mean value here. Um, I would say that the suddenly the, the 
channel seeker Fermi method estimating field strengths uh, it it's really has sort of considerable uncertainty. I would say if the one thing in there, I think that would be a much bigger uncertainty in there. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I have other questions, but maybe I, I should wait for, uh, for other people. Enrique? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, so thank you for the talk, uh, Chiju. Um, it's well. I, I also have two questions since you already have this one, he, this uh, this image here. So uh, I can also uh, ask about this one first, and then then I later on this next round, perhaps I can ask about how you measure the the genes masses uh, for the fragmentation. But for here, uh, this it's very interesting that this I think is a similar trend of what is observed for the kinetic uh, virial parameter. If you sort of correlate the, the column density with the mass, but al although I'm, I'm not exactly sure, for example, it is known that the kinetic virial parameter tends to decrease with the mass of the object. Um, so if you plotted the mass, the, the, the magnetic virial parameter versus the mass of the cores rather than versus the, the column density, would you obtain the same uh, trend or not? H have you tried that? Um, so the <laughs> mass would be, um, because the maps were done um, in sort of a different telescopes, right? So, so mm -hmm. um, in terms of size, so the mass uh will be very different just depend on how those maps been produced now mm -hmm. we have not done the way of say if i identify a clump in there and then we'll be sort of comparing apple with apples oh I see. Uh, so that the two yeah the short answer is no we have not done that it's just because of the limitation of the data because what's shown here is uh, over 400 uh, uh over 200 regions being observed mm -hmm. uh with different telescopes so, mm -hmm. so there, even though you, you know, even if you try to identify structure, you will not actually be um, comparing apples with apples, so to speak. Because oh. when you look at ALMA data that, you know, your probing resolution of um, thousands of AU uh, versus when you look at the uh, Planck data, uh, you know, we're talking about sort of a sort of fractional parsec resolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it's interesting because I don't know if uh, you are aware of a paper that Gilberto, Aina, and I published last year, where we showed precisely that uh, the innermost parts of um, of an object, which is globally gravitationally bound, tend to look less bound. So, uh, but here I, I don't know how to relate this plot. Uh, to, to that result because we were talking about radii or masses. So it would be interesting. But if, if for example, uh, the column density here, so this is just for pointings, right? It's not for individual objects, is what, that what you're saying? This is not for individual uh, objects. There, yeah, there are 200, over 200 objects in, uh, in this plot. Okay, and so it's just pointings, uh-huh, okay. That's right, yeah. I think it, the, um, Mm -hmm. The the kinetic feral parameter uh, that we looked at it, they also uh, at least in infrared dark clouds uh, in a similar manner, uh, they also have this mm -hmm. trend. Mm -hmm. Now, if you follow that for you know evolutionary sort of more later stage, actually uh, the trend may change because I think the the star formation and feedback may act actually increase uh, oh, yeah. its kinetic, uh, the line width. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. Yeah, this is very interesting. We should, we should discuss it. I'll, I'll let other people ask and then maybe I can ask the other question. Uh, I see there's no more answer. Uh, okay, Gilberto. <laughs> the, yeah, continuing with Enrique's argument. Uh, what about evolution in the pre-stellar stage? If you have an object that is collapsing and at the same time accreting material, 
you will see a higher column density, but also you're going to see more of the material involved in the collapse. So mm -hmm. that, that, that's a little bit what I, what I was thinking about when, you, when I said higher column density, you see more material involved in the collapse. Yeah, so the I, I think the if you compare typically pre-stellar versus protostellar uh, stage of those dense cores, I think the column density in pre-stellar stage are lower than protostellar stage. Mm -hmm. um, that that I think is borne out in 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 a lot of observations uh, or including surveys. Right, right, but you still what what. We're talking about this evolution in the pre-stellar stage. So you have a small core that keeps accreting material, and then the column density increases. Mm -hmm. That's right. If you follow an individual core, you should see this continue in in column density go from going from pre-stellar to you know uh, proto uh, 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 protostellar, right? Uh -huh. So the material that will eventually fall into the core is not observable at certain column densities. But is also form going to fall, is involved in the collapse. Yes. Yeah, I guess in other words, uh, perhaps what the, the point here is how much mass is really involved in the collapse versus how much mass are you able to detect, no? For example, is, would, that, would that be your point, Roberto? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think okay. the in, in in this particular plot, we, we won't have a means to separate those because they are you know coming from different regions. So we're we're essentially <clears throat> seeing a trend. We think that you know that the, the ones that with particular high column densities, they are they tend to be a bit more evolved. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks. More questions, Enrique, Gilberto? I think Javier has his hand up. Uh, I haven't seen it. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the thing is that I have another important meeting right now, so I was uh, getting out. So oh. I, it, it's, it's very quickly. Um, if Enrique had this question about the, 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 the VR parameter, the magnetic VR parameter against the mass. And I was wondering if you computed the, the, the gravitational energy, then you have the mass and the and the size, isn't it? The yeah, we have the mass and size, yes. So then you could plot it against the mass. Yes, except that the the, the um again the the way that we're doing this um the, the way that we go in, uh, we, we did it on, uh, go in this map is, is really just getting average density and average uh, magnetic field strengths. Mm -hmm. I think the approach you describe uh, will have a difficulty because if we do a sub region, we may not have enough statistics to derive magnetic field strengths. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I understand, but, but we can get into that later. I, I can write it to you. Maybe um, we yeah. should organize a, a little meeting uh, post your colloquium. <laughs> uh, with the group. That'll be, that'll be, uh, that'll be fun. <laughs> yes, be fun. Um, yeah. So uh, can I ask? I, I guess so. No? Uh -huh. So my other question was related to the fragmentation and the, uh, you were saying that you needed the uh, turbulence and magnetic fields in order to understand the fragmentation. But I wanted to ask, uh, what, where are the genes masses measured for, for what densities uh, are, are for the background density or for the local density or, or how, how, how were those measured? I, I don't know if I missed it. Yeah, so I think the, uh, yeah, this is a good point actually. So the, um, so the way that we analyze fragmentation is that, so for the, uh, for the maps we're seeing uh, in high resolution, you see those dense cores. Mm -hmm. We think this is coming from the initial collapse of this clump mm -hmm. in here. So then, uh, so we use the density and temperature in the clump okay. to calculate the genes mass. And that is 
the one that comes out to about two solar That's masses. That's about two solar mass. Yeah. So my point is that if I give you this map, mm -hmm. just in the first instance, you say, you know, we observe it at different angle resolution. And, and if you look at this mass compared to the, the global genes mass, you may come with a different conclusion. Mm -hmm. But my yeah. argument here is that um, the, you know, that the, the further fragmentation is done is actually is the core fragmentation. So you have to mm -hmm. use those local properties. Exactly. Uh -huh. like the, the genes mass. So in, in this map, for example, now the, the genes mass is calculated with the core mass uh, and compared to the mass of the fragments. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So you need, you know, the global genes mass is two solar masses, but if you use a property in the core to calculate the local thermal genes mass, it's about 0.4 mm -hmm. solar masses. I see. Okay. And, um, and then my last question, which I thought Ina would ask, but I don't see her hand up, so I might ask her. I ask it myself. Uh, I was thinking you would ask it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but is there like a correlation with the genes mass, for example? Um, because I, I noticed that, for example, in Ina's papers, she has concluded that it's thermal genes fragmentation. So I would like to understand how this is different from that. And my understanding is that in her papers, uh, there, there is a factor, there's a, a, an efficiency factor that comes in. But other than that, there, there is the same trend. So it's more the trend uh, that defines the, the uh, correspondence to the genes mass, to the thermal genes mass, than the actual values. Is that the case here or is it not the case here? So this, that would be the case here. So yeah, I think the, so what we've been, uh, what we're saying is that for the most massive cores in the cluster that mm -hmm. cannot be accounted with thermal genes fragmentation. Mm -hmm. so, but if you look at the IMF or, you know, a core mass function, the majority of cores actually are lower mass objects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the ensemble, uh, majority of those cores are consistent with sort of thermal genes fragmentation uh -huh. in the cluster. Yeah. 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 So Chisu is talking about the most massive uh, fragments. And in, a, in my papers, I'm focusing on the number of fragments. Oh, okay. So, on an average um, sense. Sorry? In an average sense. The number of fragments, whether you have a core with higher fragmentation in terms of number of fragments. Uh -huh. I see. This is worried about the mass of the most massive fragments. So how do you make such massive fragments? I see. Okay, I see. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so just uh -huh. go ahead. I I know. Yeah, it was. I'm always thinking about this uh, about these two different results that we have, mm -hmm. uh, actually, because in in my papers also most of the cores have low masses comparable to genes mass. But uh, what do you think about the possible evolutionary effect? Because your G28, I think, is, a very, is in a very early evolutionary stage, right? And in the massive them scores that I usually uh, include in my samples are more evolved. So maybe this could also explain a little bit this. Kind That's of. right. So when you have, when you let it evolve, uh, they're going to further collapse and fragment. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, yeah, there is a, a, a sort of a difficulty of say, what is the condition lead to the, uh, what you observed? Uh, but in Reiki, I think the, yeah, so what Ina's mm -hmm. point is that when you look at sort of a, uh, either core mass function or stellar mass, you know, function, mm -hmm. Majority of them are lower mass. They are sort of coincides with sort of genes mass. I see. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I see. Okay. Yeah. Th th this is very interesting. Yeah, I, I think we should definitely invite you or or, or suggest that we have a, a little group meeting to discuss our results in in slightly more detail and and, and see whether we can understand some of the some of what you, some of your observations. Uh, it'd be very nice. Yeah, well, I would love to, uh, definitely. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I see there's no more 
questions. So thanks uh, to the speaker again, and see you uh, next Thursday.